Hello, everyone. Welcome to another one-on-one -on -one Talking Feds on Patreon. Those of you who listened to our recent journalism episode trying to gauge the impact of eight years of Trump and Trumpism on the journalistic journalism industry and the path forward uh, are well aware that one perhaps the most important institution that seemed to have taken a huge hit, not just in the last eight years, but the last 20, and that seems indispensable in many ways to uh, democratic values and communal life is local journalism, local newspapers, which are uh, closing up at a clip of two a day and have just been totally hammered in the age of social media. Um, I wanted to talk about that really very, very important problem and its implications and the perfect person to do it with, Steve Waldman, who is here with us today. He is the previous uh, president of Report for America and before that a, a um, longtime reporter, but he's founded in the last um, few years a consortium known as Rebuild local news and this is you know dead uh center this what he uh thinks about and works on and he has you know very um promising ideas for what it has many people have taken to be a hopeless project of rebuilding local news so steve waldman thanks for being with us oh thank you for having me um, you know, let's just start with the grim part. I uh, I grew up in a city with two thriving local newspapers. The model then was low price with a lot of ads, and they, you know everything just seems to have gone into um, uh, dormancy or extinction. What's the what's the sort of state of play of local news across the nation? Yeah, it's really astonishing how severe the collapse has been in a really pretty short amount of time. There's been an 82% drop in newspaper advertising revenue in about two decades, which has led to about a 60% drop in the number of reporters. And that is seen in all sorts of ways. Literally thousands of newspapers have closed. Several thousand others have not closed, but are what we call ghost newspapers, right. uh, and which is basically a newspaper that's barely covering the community. There's another category uh, that I was alerted to by uh, reading about something in Salinas, California, which is, I don't know, maybe we call this a zombie newspaper. It's a daily newspaper without any reporters, which is kind of a mind boggling concept. And in general, it just means that the coverage of communities is way, way down, and it has really profound implications. Uh, you know, there's which I want to get to in a in a moment. Let's let's just chronicle it a little bit more. I think I like I lived in the Bay Area, and the Chronicle was hanging in there, not so much the Examiner, but the Oakland Tribune. You'd pick it up, and it would be all wire service stories and and the like. Nothing of the and and I don't know how the local staff um, uh, reflected it. So um, when you get uh, national um, coverage kind of cannibalizing what, what would have been local reporters, what's lost? And maybe now's the first time to talk about, is there any sense in which what's lost is replaced or um, functionally um, superseded by the whole flotilla of local reporting or substacks and the like, or are these things that are lost, you know, lost to the world? Well, you know, there's some hope that it eventually will be replaced by some of these new players, and we can talk about that. But so far, it hasn't been, or at least not on the scale. the The amount added back in is tiny compared to what's been lost. And Which is it, what in, in in broad strokes? Well, when you when you're in a town, some for some towns they literally have no local news. It's like not even a matter of gray areas or quality or something like that. There are thousands of communities that are news deserts to the point of not having any local news. That's and, by the way not a Waldman term. That's a term of art out there now. News deserts, yes, yes. It is. There's like a whole new vocabulary that has right. arisen to help describe this new phenomenon. News deserts is one of them. And 
in those areas, by the way, what happens is the vacuum is filled by national news or social media or rumor or, you know, so other forces. Uh, so we can come back to that, what happens in, in a situation like that. So then you have in places where it hasn't totally gone away, what you tend to have is more superficial coverage. Like if you have, you know, one person who used to cover uh, the the school system now covers the school system and the hospitals and criminal justice. And you can imagine that, you know, it's not very deep. Then you have the more another extreme example of these papers that are kind of they're just full of wire copy and things like that. So at the best case scenario is you have more superficial coverage. And, you, you know, the, the winners in that are actually politicians to some degree because they actually control the agenda. And, uh, you know, what they put out there is more likely to actually define what is consumed. Right. They'll publish their press releases. Right. And also dirty contractors, for example. Right. That that, you know, indefatigable reporters would track down and break stories and keep pushing. No, no one. There's just no replacement for that. Uh, traditional function. Yeah, community, exactly. Right? And this, it, and there's, you know, there's a few different parts of it. One is what you were just saying is the kind of accountability function. And that's everything from hardcore investigative reporting of holding accountable for contractors and things like that, uh, to softer things like showing up at the school board meeting and making sure someone is actually watching what they're doing. You know, people have said that, like, just being there is a level of accountability that is meaningful even before you write a word that someone that the people up on the dais know that someone is watching. Um, so there's that, the- and that aspect jumped out at me as a former law enforcement guy. But your work, uh, Steve, really brought home a, maybe a bigger, but certainly a huge other component that's missing that you uh, I think you know can roughly be summarized in the term community cohesion. Can you just speak to that a little? Yeah, this part is a little less intuitive in a way, right? Like it's yeah. it's easy to understand if you don't have reporters that you might have more corruption and waste and things like that. But the co- co- community cohesion part is really interesting. And so one way of looking at it is in the negative, which is when you have this gap, this vacuum, it's getting filled by other stuff. A lot of what it's getting filled by is national news, which is more polarizing and, you know, it's just more likely for all sorts of reasons that you've covered on your podcast many times that like that kind of material is more likely to lead to people demonizing each other and viewing each other as the enemy instead of their neighbor. And it's it's not like. Which, and of course, they're not their neighbor, right? There's some, uh, you know, they're from Redland in Montana, not exactly. from the two blocks over. Yeah. And that's a really important difference. You know, it turns out like it's not like if anyone has been involved in local issues, even before the modern day, like there's plenty of controversy and conflict, like people get worked up over local things, too. But it is different when you know that you're going to see that person at the Little League game the next day or in the supermarket or that you're just looking at them in the face as you're talking like that does make a big difference. You're, and the fault like, lines are different, right? The, you know, the bond issue or the little league, they're less, you know, reflexively what, what we could call red V blue in, uh, in national politics. Exactly. No? And that that's really significant because it means you're, everyone's cross pressure. You know, it's like, there's, mm-hmm. you might be one thing and you're not you, the person down the block who might, disagree with you on national politics may be on your side when it comes to the playground or the sewage treatment plant or something like that because and that you know the fact that you have these the teams are shifting you know makes it more likely to be human and cohesive and so that's sort of the you know what's the, the what happens when there's more divisive content but there's also a positive aspect to what when it's healthy which is that local news is part of what how you learn about other people, like from yeah. obituaries, you know, you learning about people you didn't know about or inspiring. It might be very different from you or, you know, high school sports is creating a sense of commonality. That's a huge, you've written a lot about that. You have a big people should, who get interested in this. Check out Steve's um, article, which is called, I think got it right here how high school sports coverage can save democracy and it's a little bit tongue-in-cheek but not really there's a lot to this uh for anyone who's ever seen say friday night lights but i'm sorry continue 
Well, it's it's like that. It's sort of the, yeah. you're creating a common er, common goal and set of values and identity that is, you know, something other than your partisan identity, and that you know that is meaningful. That what one of the studies, there's been a lot of studies about you know what happens in different communities when there's less local news, and and there have been studies that shown there's more polarization and things like that. One of the most fascinating ones to me was that in places where there's less local news, people were far more likely to agree with the statement, no one is listening to me and I have no influence on the community and what happens here. So it's very much connected to alienation, which we know is a powerful force in, you know, probably even in the sort of spread of authoritarianism. I mean, I don't want to overstate the case, but but I, I do think that that sense of alienation is and lack of attachment to community is part of what's going on in the bigger you know, pollution of our polity sense. Yeah. So, I, you know, look, I grew up in Pittsburgh and I, my parents and friends were, you know, sort of uh, sophisticated types, but they turned first to the Post Gazette, uh, the local paper. And even for like, you know, the Norman Rockwell stuff of the 50th anniversaries and those sorts of things. And then you dive into the New York Times selectively. But I mean, it's just you're on the streetcar. That's what people are reading. It's a shared set of information. Oh, my gosh, this guy, you know, is in the newspaper for the winning touchdown. It's it uh, it contributes to a sense of community that, yeah, I to my mind, I mean, I'd be, I, I was really eager to talk to you, Steve, because I don't know. Uh, there are there are lots of things one can say about the journalism's role in the fight against authoritarianism and Trump and what what function it should play now. But this um, very critical democratic, for lack of a better word, function, you, you just don't know how it's replicated. So let me ask you, because you actually have ideas here. You're not simply there sounding the alarm of everything that's been lost, but you actually think it's less uh, daunting, I think, than than most people in the industry assume to try to revive a functional local news industry. Yes, and, and what what's your thinking there? Well, the the thing that makes it seem solvable is that the dollar amount of what it would take in sort of some combination of film, philanthropy and public support is relatively small compared to other problems <laughs> like, you know, climate change or gun violence or something right. like that. A, a friend of mine who's in this field says it's a ballet sized problem, which he doesn't, <laughs> mean, he doesn't mean that disparagingly. No, that's, actually I'm not a, sure that's the best example. Yeah, I know. It's, but, uh, attributed it's it a Robert Maplethorpe kind of, uh, maybe. Yeah. Not. Yeah. Yeah, keep it, going, what he meant but. is that literally the amount yeah. of money that people donate to ballet right, right. in America is about what you would need. So it's, uh, you know, by mortal standards, it's a lot of money. It's like a billion or two a year. That's a lot of money to me. But when you compare that to all the other problems that we're dealing with, it's it's sort of a cheap date compared to the... the and that, so that literally is for, you know, a check for $1.5 billion a year for indefinitely would um, reinstate the local news industry to the place it... it role it played in 1960s America. Is that is that right? Well, if it's done the right way, like you could certainly waste, you know, a billion or two rather easily yeah. on things that, that move yeah. the needle. But but yeah, because you know you don't need to get it you don't need to get the dollar amounts back to where it was because there's a whole big chunk of that industry that was geared toward the printing presses and the delivery men and you know things that Right. Or, or, you know, the library, uh, the clip service and things like that, that you don't need to do now. So you can be, you know, technology, even though it has also helped cause this problem, does make it so that any given reporter can carry, you know, more weight than there. So you don't need to necessarily replicate it entirely. But if what, what I think we need is about 25,000 reporters. And that would be more or less about a 50 percent increase or almost double in the number well of you said we're down about 60 percent. i would have thought it was even more but so how many when when we were fully staffed as a nation as it were in local reporters how many did we have at about fifty thousand, uh, a little more than that if you include tv so more like 70 gotcha all right so th this is a really bare subsistence plan waldman plan here 
Yeah, yeah. It, it would be better if we had more than that, there. but I think this would get us out of the emergency out of the emergency room at least. If if they're, you know, if you're if you're targeting them in the right areas. I mean, it's like, you know, you're talking about an area where, that doesn't have any reporters in it. Like having a reporter is a really big difference. Now, would I rather have five reporters? Yeah. yeah. But the difference between zero and one is enormous. Yeah. So um, go ahead. Sorry. Well, it's and by the way, when we're talking about like how do you do that, that's sort of on a macroeconomic level right. is how much money it would take. It's gonna end up having to be some combination of improved business models. Like there's still tons of innovation going on to try to improve the revenue models, better engagement. I mean, there's a lot of exciting work to actually make local news better. Like yeah. we all can say, like at the same time we're bemoaning the loss of it, a lot of it is crap. So, you know, we want to try to do the build back better um, in a way. Mm -hmm. But so there's the, the business model improvements. There's increased philanthropy. I mean, part of what I think we just have to recognize as a society is that some of what local news is, is a public good. It's, it's the sort of thing that we probably have to look at a little bit like our public libraries right. or... Uh, things like that. What where, a datum that you had there, more librarians now than local reporters. But yeah, right. sorry, go ahead. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So it didn't used to be the case. There used to be <laughs> meant, yeah. almost twice as many, but what's right. the difference is that the librarians are paid, salaries are paid by taxpayers. Right. And uh, journalists weren't. So um, now it's it's uh, more librarians. So there, had, there there needs to be a increased role for philanthropy for sure. Um, and there needs to be this sense in the philanthropic world. And by philanthropy, I mean big, medium, and little. Like small donor philanthropy is important as well. Local community foundations, things like that. They just have but to. But you're be already working with, say, Ford and Knight, some pretty big players. And I yeah. assume you, you also are talking about tax breaks and stuff. And this is probably yeah. in the category of you should have such problems. But um, it's a little bit tricky to, ha to have publicly funded local journalism, I assume. Yeah, it, it is. Right. And it's, you know, but I think it's possible. So yeah. I think the third leg of the stool is public policy. And I say public policy as opposed to government subsidies, because there are some aspects of public policy like antitrust law that aren't necessarily direct subsidies, subsidies but may be quite important. Um, but on the subsidy side, you know, we have had various subsidies through American history for the media that, you know, we're not as conscious of. But the, the postal subsidy that started in the very mm -hmm. early days of the founding fathers was really significant. I mean, in modern dollars, it would be about $40 billion a year, like the size of the NASA budget. So and and you know from a First Amendment perspective, it's somewhat comforting that the guy who wrote the First Amendment, uh, you know, Madison was also pushing for a massive subsidy of the newspaper industry at the same time. And I think it's they they felt like a it was important to do, but that it could be done in a way that was First Amendment friendly and constitutional. And there are things to be learned from the approach that they took. It, it was content neutral. It wasn't a government trying to like make quality judgments. There's all sorts of horrible stuff that got postal subsidies in the 1800s. Yeah. Um, and so I think the modern versions of that ought to have similar principles. I'll give you an example. There's a bill that is, is it's probably the best bill out there, at least on the federal level. Uh, that was introduced a couple months ago by a conservative Republican from upstate New York named Claudia Tenney and a progressive Democrat, Suzanne Dalbeni. And the first part of it is a tax credit for small businesses that advertise in local news. It's really clever because, you know, yeah. there's not a government entity that's making the decision in that case. It's the restaurant. And they're putting money in, the, they're putting skin in the game too. So they're only going to use it with newspaper. But it's sort of, juices the uh the buying power of an of a marginal small business advertiser in a way that helps both the small business and the so that's a good example of how you can imagine if you're creative about it ways of doing this that would be safe i said the other idea that i think is probably a little trickier but is doable is a is kind of almost like ppp thing of a a refundable payroll tax credit to news organizations for hiring or retaining local reporters. And like the postal subsidy, it's very broad. And 
we have to get used to the idea that it would end up subsidizing people we don't like as well as those that we do. It's just like a baseline, you know, let's kind of raise First the floor a little yeah. bit. But I like things like, I think that's the way to go as opposed to a great big like corporation for public broadcasting type you know, discretionary grant fund where there's a board of people making judgments about what good journalism would be. Right, right, right. I think you always have to approach this anytime you're looking at public policy that involves supporting the news, you have to assume that your worst enemy is in charge of it. And how will it work? Like I would always say, like anyone, time someone gives me an idea, I say, okay, cool, that sounds interesting. Now let's assume that Jared Kushner is the secretary of news and he will be administering it. Does it still work? Right. This is very far afield to what we're talking about, but I have to say that that um, uh, mindset and mentor is one I apply in many different areas. If people just don't um, uh, think enough in advance about what will happen if the wrong hands are there. All right. So I've I looked. The first step in all of this is the increased consciousness of the not just the problem, but it's sort of implications. And uh, so there you have it. Rebuild local news. And Steve Waldman are doing uh, uh, Lions work um, in in doing that. If people want to just learn more, I mean, what was really preparing for this um, ta- discussion, what really was eye opening to me is the many different ways I had, as I said, the mindset of what's happening to the local uh, crimes not being ferreted out. But there's so much more of a role that uh, local newspapers play. Where where would they, where would people go, Steve, to learn a little bit more about what's being lost and the sort of stakes of the overall fight you've taken on? Yeah, rebuildlocalnews.org. Uh, we have a whole section about the problem that mm-hmm. reviews all that and the research, as well as some of the ideas uh, about how to solve it. And that seems like a good place to start. RebuildLocalNews.org. Steve Waldman, thanks for spending uh, some some time with us today talking about it. Oh, I really appreciate the, the focus on this topic. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.